90s TV series, Leaving Home, Simon Rattle, the incredible conductor, he talks about Marla being the antithesis of tonal music and being sort of the very last gasp of the romantic tradition. I would totally agree that Marla is definitely this kind of last gasp, if you will, of this great German tradition of music making. However, I do think that often people overlook the legacy of Richard Strauss. Strauss is probably about the same generation as Marla, is about the same age, but Marla died when he was about 50 and Strauss went on to live until 1948 or 49 or something and lived throughout the Second World War and the First World War and as you can imagine lived through a huge change in Germany. I think it's really important to talk about Richard Strauss in that sense because he really does represent the end of German culture and the German dominance of classical music. Arnold Schoenberg goes on to, of course, change the face of music forever, but he has to flee Germany because of the Nazis. While Strauss stays in Europe, he works under the Nazi regime, is attempting and works with the people left in Germany after the war um, to create something new from the ashes. Strauss is often thought about as a popular composer and is often discredited for that. He's not thought about as being particularly academic, though that seems to be changing in the past kind of 10 years. Uh, academics and musicologists seem to be taking him a little bit more seriously. Why do I want to talk about Strauss? Why do I think Strauss is important? I've always loved Richard Strauss's music. Um, the, my first experience with him is probably the opera Der Rosenkavalier, um, there was like a production with Elizabeth Schwarzkopf from like the 1950s that was probably on TV like late on a Sunday night that I came across once and I just remember being completely transfixed with the beauty of that opera. And so I always knew about Richard Strauss but I never really kind of like delved in too deep. I think a big part of why Richard Strauss is often sort of overlooked is his association in the 1930s with the Nazi party, which we have to talk about. So his association is quite interesting because he really did think of himself as one of the greatest living composers, which he definitely is and was, um, but he, the, there is a lot of ego there. Um, if you read his letters, um, there's letters between Strauss and Hitler and also Goebbels. Strauss is very vocal about his position. He knows the power that he wields. He's like an old guy by that stage and he, you know, knows that he is the top dog and he tells Hitler where to shove it and it's really quite fantastic to read. We do have to acknowledge that he did run um, a organisation that was established as like the Music Reich Music Chamber, which uh, was put together to represent composers, organise um, copyright and to collect royalties for composers. It's sort of complicated because he's very apolitical. He never joined the Nazi party, I don't believe, and he never expressed um, his anger at the Nazi regime, but he was obviously complicit in a way where he was just trying to navigate his way through the system. He eventually quit that role as the Reich Chancellery, Chancellery, Chancellery thing, this institution that he was heading up. Uh, he eventually quit. The row between him and Hitler started because he was working with a um, opera librettist on a new opera and that librettist was Jewish and Hitler was basically like, you cannot under any circumstances have this opera performed and Strauss is like, <laughs> I'm the greatest living composer, I will do what I want, thank you very much, goodbye. And that's why I think about Strauss a lot myself because he like was very pragmatic and trying to navigate his way through literally one of the worst situations humanity could find itself in of all time. And of course, this collaborator of his was German. His, I believe, daughter-in-law married a Jewish person. So, um, you know, he worked with Jewish people and he was supporting them. So he was certainly not complicit to the Nazi regime. Also, after the war, he was involved in a denazification trial and was found to not be a Nazi. So that tells you that he's not. 
Strauss really spent his whole life kind of trying to stay away from politics as much as he could. Uh, and as I said, was really pragmatic in that respect. Him and Mahler are often kind of pitted against each other as being sort of kind of competitive and they certainly knew each other and were mates. Um, but I do believe there is a bit of a competition there as well. Mahler uh, was Jewish and so he had to go through a whole different kind of bucket of hoops, um, bucket of hoops. He had to jump through a whole lot of hoops um, to get to his lofty position um, because he was Jewish. So he had to convert to Catholicism and also really um, win over the Wagner family to be able to conduct in Bayreuth. Um, I spoke about Wagner previously in a previous video. Um, it might be worth looking at that because it gives some context to Strauss and the sort of German culture at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Why am I interested in this period of time? I find it really interesting that you, you have this idea of, of Mahler and Strauss being the end of this great tradition of music making, and you can really get a sense that the world is changing. The world is starting to open up culturally, technology is changing, communication is changing, and so composers are also changing their approach and what they do, and music becomes really diverse, and this kind of legacy, this huge German tradition, starts to be questioned in a way. You get com more composers from Russia, people like Stravinsky come through, um, different approaches are taken, different um, rhythmic styles are brought in from music that's non-European. Uh, so I think it's just a really fascinating period to, to look into. And Strauss bridges this entire time. Also, this Strauss is really interesting because he's kind of like, I, I really admire him because he does something that I try and do, which is like, he explores taboo themes in his work. Now, they're not taboo so much in our eyes now, but for the times that they were written, they were hugely controversial. Like, Der Rosenkavalier opens with, like, two orgasms in the music, and it's clear. They're in bed, the two main characters are in bed having sex, and you hear the orgasms in the orchestra. That is, like, you can't just... just that. And this is an opera that he, like, attributes to being his, like, Mozart marriage of Figaro type opera. He's also, of course, very famous for his two very scandalous operas from the beginning of the 20th century, Salome. <laughs> If you do not know them, you need to listen to these operas. Electra especially. It is raw and guttural and, and earthy. Salome is sumptuous over the top. They both really represent a fin de cercle, sort of um, last gasp of European romanticism before we get to the First World War. The premiere of Salome, or one, I don't know if it's the world premiere, but there was a performance, a famous performance in Graz in 1906. And basically it's gone down in opera history as being like the most kind of one of the most like incredible performances. Everybody said they were there, like everybody. And people have like lied about saying that they were at this premiere. So Salome caused this huge controversy um, in its day and propelled Strauss into stardom. He became like huge composer, super, super famous, conducting all over the world. I also want to talk a little bit about his conducting style. You can watch some footage of it. He basically just stands there and, like, doesn't really do much. He just beats time in one hand and just... There's even somewhere, I think, a video of him, like, pulling out his watch and looking at his watch in the middle of a concert. So I think that speaks volumes to the sort of guy he was. Again, very pragmatic, very dedicated to his craft and dedicated to creating beautiful things, but also just aware of, like, human human life, humanity. He didn't, you know, there was no pretension about what he did. He wrote for The Voice, and again, I think that speaks to his sort of approach. He wrote orchestral music, incredible orchestral music. He wrote for huge orchestras, probably the biggest orchestras you get. His early work is all tone poems, kind of like an opera without singers in a way, but he really finds his feet in writing opera and writing for The Voice. 
His wife was a singer, wrote a lot for her, and he really just shines writing, especially for women, uh, women singers. His vocal writing is really exquisite. I think it's really important to talk about because, again, it shows a pragmatism, it shows a, a sense of drama, it shows this ability to write a beautiful singular line surrounded by orchestral music. Now, that's not to say that a composer that just focuses on, on orchestral music doesn't achieve beauty as well, um, but I have this theory with Strauss um, and music in general. In classical music, we love to like pair up composers. So in the history of classical music, you always get these like pairs, sometimes three, sometimes four, and it's like Mozart and Beethoven, Bach and Handel, Brahms and Wagner, Mahler and Strauss. Uh, and so I think it's interesting looking at these comparisons because they do draw the kind of two different approaches that are often there in music. That is, one is more based on theatre music, the other based more on concert music. Now, what do I mean by that? So theatre music, we're talking ballet, we're talking opera. Uh, for concert music, we're talking symphonies, chamber music, concerti. But that's not to say that the other composers didn't do the other genres. Um, they just seem to do their best work in one or the other. The most obvious example is Mozart and Beethoven. So Beethoven, of course, wrote his nine huge, important symphonies. Tons of string quartets, tons of piano music, tons of piano concertos, violin concertos, blah, 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 blah. He also wrote an opera, Fidelio, and it is very important. However, Mozart, who also wrote tons of concertos, tons of symphonies, tons of string, string quartets, chamber music, and was like super important for the music that he produced in that sphere, wrote so many incredible operas, and arguably the operas stand as being his true masterpieces, the great high points of Mozart's writing is really in his operas. And his other writing that is excellent um, is so influenced by the opera. His concertos are almost aria-like pieces. You could almost arguably replace the solo instruments with singers sometimes. Of course you can't, but you, you, you get that sense about them. Beethoven, it's different. The approach is different. He's very interested in instrumental writing. He's very interested in changes to instruments as well. He brings in new technology into the orchestra. Of course, Mozart does this as well, but it's, it's in a different way. It's often in the theatre that he brings in instruments that are not common um, in, uh, up until that point in classical music. For instance, in the Magic Flute, he brings in trombones that are often not used up until that point. They were, the technology was quite new. So what I'm saying is that I think it's really fascinating looking at these pairings because they often fall in this way, where there's one composer that is often credited to be more, dare I say, academic, for instance, Bach, and another who's considered to be more theatrical, for instance, Handel. So Handel wrote a lot of theatre music, vocal music, um, music that it was for the voice. Bach, of course, did as well, and some incredible best written music for the voice ever. But his reputation sits uh, against a lot of music that was based on um, liturgical music or based on um, music that is would arguably be in the concert hall. So this Dichotomy exists, and it's 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 ever present in so many composers. Ravel and Debussy, um, as I said, Wagner and Brahms are two really big ones as well, uh, and those two, of course, super influential on Strauss and Mahler. Mahler was an opera conductor. He worked in the theatre. He knew the theatre. His symphonic writing is very theatrical. I always wish Mahler had written an opera. It would have been incredible to see what he would have done with a theatre work. He did not. He wrote symphonies and he chose to do that. He could have written an opera. I think there is um, scraps of, of an opera, uh, but he never did. He wrote symphonies. Strauss wrote symphonies, but his reputation and his best work is in the opera. And I find that really, really fascinating. And again, I do believe there is a slight prejudice against that. Composers of the symphonic or concert hall are often put on a slightly higher pedestal to their theatre colleagues. So I do think that Richard Strauss does suffer a little bit from this kind of prejudice against the theatre composer in a way. I'm really fascinated by Electra. I think Electra is 
an incredibly underrated piece. It was written at a time before the First World War where, as I've mentioned in previous videos, the importance of Perilonaire and the Rite of Spring in the history of classical music and the history of music in general. Those two works change and free harmony to be thought about in a completely different way. And both works caused huge controversies when they were premiered. I would argue that Electra falls in that category as well, and it's often overlooked as a piece of expressionist music. You listen to it and it sounds like Strauss. There's every Straussian kind of thing there. The huge orchestra, the beautiful vocal lines. He changes his musical world to be so covered in mud and blood and it is dripping with just disgusting, awful, kind of this awful world um, in ancient Greece. The sound world he creates is like nightmarish and full of murder and the music is raw and has screams and it has huge percussion sections. It's just really, really, ugh, it's really good music. <laughs> and it's just not given the time. Like, it's performed a lot and it is very difficult. Like, it's like a conducting concerto. Like, if you're a conductor of opera, to conduct Electra is like a big deal because you, you've been given a huge orchestra and a huge battery of sound that you need to conceptualise and prepare. And often the, the singing roles are so huge that you need like the best singers in the world to, to achieve the effects that Strauss wants. So I think Electra really needs to be rethought um, as a part of this early expressionist period. His harmony in, in Electra is far more free. It's far more like Perilinaire. Uh, he doesn't stick to tonal centres. I think Electra really needs to be rethought as a core work from this early expressionist period. In the work, Strauss has an approach similar to Schoenberg, where his harmony is a lot more free, it's a lot more wild, it's really visceral. But once Strauss finished that work and saw the kind of um, violence in the music that he had created... He couldn't do it again, and he didn't return to that sort of style of writing. He went back into a more kind of traditional approach, especially in Dovos and Cavalier. He really wanted to kind of emulate Mozart in a way, and he created probably one of the most beautiful operas of all time. So I think it's really fascinating to look at Electra. It is one work in a huge output by Strauss, but it does show a real vigour and a daring to really change and push music. I think he kind of scares himself with Electra and he can't go back to that way of writing. And so he really um, tries to reinvent the end of Romanticism in a way. He returns in Rodolfo's and Cavalier and the later works into a lot more comfortable, sumptuous surrounds. But there's always Electra. It's always there. He's always got that, that violence and visceral aspect in his output. Often Strauss is also spoken about in some of the reading I've done as kind of being a Wagnerian composer. He writes these operas in a Wagnerian style and, you know, that's the end. I think we need to also talk about Strauss in the context of his time and that he creates things that are completely different to Wagner. His humour, his grace, his beauty in his music is something that Wagner just isn't quite able to do. To me, Wagner is just full of pomposity and power and, you know, there's a real sense of gravitas in his music and these are all positive things i am not against this at all I, I as i said in my wagner video i love wagner i listen to it all the time but the characters lack a little bit of humanity they're very mythological uh, and there is a certain lack of human spirit wagner wanted to create mythological work works that were deeply rooted in German myths and, and gods, and so there needs to be a loftiness in the music. Strauss wants to write for people. You really see in the Strauss operas the humanity of these people. I think King Herod, for instance, in Salome, he's not depicted as this sort of 
high saluting, you know, remarkable king. He's flawed. He's, he's, oh, he's flawed. He's, you know, sexualized. He has desires. He has really questionable decisions, you know, and he's a king. And I think that's important, like comparing that to Wagner, where, yeah, there are some questionable um, royal figures or godlike figures in his operas, but essentially there's always this sense of the world and the world um, that these characters inhibit and how they are a part of this world. And it's all very noble. Strauss, that nobility isn't necessarily always there. There is, there is a depth of humanity there that really speaks to me. He has a tenderness in his music as well that resonates with me and I feel that Wagner sometimes lacks. And so I just disagree with this kind of lumping him in as this sort of Wagnerite who wrote Wagner-esque operas and, and that's that. I really do think Strauss kind of paved his own pathway. The critics often didn't like what he did, but the works were incredibly popular. And so he's entered into the canon in a way that He's often seen as being popularist, so he's often not thought about, um, again, as a serious composer, but I would argue that he was incredibly pragmatic and incredibly gifted and just completely rethought the way that we use the orchestra. Finally, I want to talk about the late period of Strauss's life, um, where he produced some really fascinating music. He moved to Switzerland during the Second World War. By that stage, he was quite an old man, like in his 80s or something. At the end of the war, he was really instrumental working with other musicians and administrators to bring back opera to Germany. And he had a really clear vision about how that could be done. He also wrote some incredibly interesting music in this time. One of his most famous pieces and most beloved pieces is The Four Last Songs, which he wrote at the very end of his life. It is almost an essay in the end of German culture. They're beautiful, they're heartbreaking, and he captures this, this sense of the curtain closing on German romantic culture. This great arc from the 1750s in Bach through to the 1940s, um, and it's, it's incredibly sad and beautiful to, to witness that. You should really listen to the four last songs. Another work uh, that is also really important for the same reasons is the Metamorphosen for string orchestra. It contains a Beethoven quote um, and there are slight suggestions of other German composers throughout the piece. It's kind of an essay in the history of German music and it comes to such a melancholic but also proud end. And I think that's what I find most interesting about Strauss in this later period. His pride for his culture, his pride for his output as a composer in the face of utter devastation. And that's what's really remarkable about this late this last period of his music making. He also lives through a time where mass culture becomes apparent. Again, very fascinating to research this composer who is in his later half of his life and sees the birth of mass media in the world and how that completely fundamentally changes classical music forever. So please listen to some Strauss. I've got two playlists below, one for YouTube, one for Spotify with some of my uh, favourite pieces. It's just so remarkable to research and listen to a composer who saw the world change, you know, to see the world from the 1880s and the 1890s through to the 1940s, the, the huge changes that the world uh, experienced in that time and how his music changes, how his approach changes, I think is really, really fascinating to to research and and listen to his music with that in mind. So enjoy some Richard Strauss. Hey! <laughs>